Hello, this is Danilo from Peaceful Anarchism. Um, and you can also find me on the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and the Seeds of Liberty dot com. And um, so today we have Gabriel Shear, who is a anarchist from Valdivia, Chile. He uh, is a founder of Fort Galt, and um, he is here today to enlighten us on uh, perhaps a little bit, a little bit about Canada as well, since he's uh, he's originally from Canada. So we can uh, get an idea of how uh, you know the economic welfare is in Canada, and uh, and about you know how how uh, how Chile is as well. So so Gabriel, why why don't you uh, start off with um, you know how you became an anarchist, and you know what led you to this point in your life. Well, I guess I could take the lazy way out and say that I was just born that way, um, because I think I think we all are. Um, we generally are raised in the same fashion, in the sense that we're taught to behave peacefully with, with each other. You know, don't steal toys from the other kids, and don't push each other, and all that kind of thing. So, in that sense, we're all born and raised anarchists, but. It doesn't take long before our parents start adding more layers to this, you know, to uh, this whole scene. And our, our 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 teachers add a lot to it too. All these different authority figures come into play, and they add layers and layers of complexity to this that don't make a lot of sense later on. But but early on, it makes perfect sense. You know, peaceful coexistence. And that's the foundation that today I, I base everything on, on top of. It's the presupposition that we all want to coexist peacefully. And that's, I think, where the non-aggression axiom comes from. I mean, there's a lot of different moral philosophies throughout the world. And if you're not rooted in the same premise, then you're not going to get along. So I think in the future, we're going to have these different tribes, these these different for lack of a better term, nations based upon common root philosophies. So the non-aggression principle comes out of this idea that we all, all want to get along peacefully and how do we go about that in a consistent fashion? How do we have these principles that are universally applicable that we can apply to each other consistently? So that's kind of where I am now, but getting from point A as a child to point B where I am now was way more complex than it should have been. I mean, ideally, we should be just raised consistently through that through that uh, paradigm, and it shouldn't be complicated. I mean, this is a pretty simple concept. Unfortunately, my parents were very Christian, and we had to distort this concept in order to, con in order to fit into that, that mold, right? Because... When I got down to Chile last year, I was part of this entrepreneurship boot camp called Exosphere. And part of that is kind of personal development. And one of the many things that we do there is we have these discussions about uh, dogma. And why is it that people latch onto these certain dogmas? And what purposes do they serve? And that, that really got me thinking back t to my childhood and how I was raised. And basically this this whole religious dogma that i was born into it was it was it was brilliant it served a very practical evolutionary purpose and that is that it provides people with a prepackaged group of friends that they don't really have to earn hmm. you know if you if you subscribe to a certain ideology if you wave a certain banner or a, a certain flag you can roll into town and walk into the appropriate church for instance and and say i'm i'm part of this tribe hi and in, instantly you have hundreds of friends you know that you don't have to prove your worth to you, you don't have to convince of anything you just roll right in, you say, I'm part of this tribe, and instantly you have friends. Mm -hmm. So, in a small town farming kind of a community situation, that makes perfect sense. I mean, you really do depend upon neighbors and goodwill and support. And when you have these institutions that facilitate 
facilitate that kind of a networking. I mean, it makes things a lot easier. So my my dad, for instance, he rolled into this farming community and he said, "Okay, I'm I'm Christian. I fit into this this group." group and instantly he had a support network and life was pretty easy by comparison like if you don't have any support network life is a bitch <laughs> I mean it's there's a lot of hardship that you have to endure if you're trying to make your way in life all by yourself but hey he's smart and most other people are in that sense they have like a natural inclination towards this they know how to make their lives easier. So I can't fault people in that sense. It is a practical solution to a very real problem that we all face. But this does cause problems for kids because we're born and we're trying to make sense of the world. We're trying to make sense of principles. And just when we think we have it nailed down, don't push the other kid, don't steal their stuff, you know, all of a sudden, wait a minute, you're, you, you start adding on these layers of complexity that conflict with these earlier principles. So Christianity threw me for a, a loop. It was very hard for me to make sense of it. I read the Bible three times by the time I was 12, I think, from cover to cover. Wow. And, I mean, let's get real. I mean, it, it's a pretty traumatic story. <laughs> if you get like if you plow through all the Old Testament stuff, like there's some really violent shit in there, let's just be frank. <laughs> and a lot of inconsistency, which is very confusing for a child especially. Like thou shalt not kill unless I tell you to, you know. <laughs> so after a while of that, I got really frustrated and really confused, and eventually my dad and I started to fight quite a bit because there was just no reconciling this logic. I was, I guess I have to credit my mom for this a, a little bit. I mean, she encouraged me to read at a very er early age, which I think is really important for kids to you know, start e exploring on their own by reading encyclopedias and dictionaries and starting to learn f for themselves without being guided necessarily. And we used to sit down and watch Star Trek. Obviously, that's like a very, you know, forward-thinking, socially-minded kind of a, a programming, you know, package, for lack of a better term. But by about 12 or 13... I mean, the conflict in the home was pretty intense. And by 14, I went out and got a job at a bee farm. And in order to make this work, I had to go and stay with friends that were at the next town over because it was closer to this farm. And it was, it was my first job away from the family, which was really cool for me because I was always stuck at the farm working for my dad, you know, pulling weeds out in the field and all that, you know, farm boy shit. <laughs> so, so going out to get my first job like that was a big moment for me. And I had no idea how big it would really be until the very end when I didn't get to come home the conflict in the family had reached that point where my dad had just had it and there was no reconciling that that scene so i basically had to go and live with his extended family so his dad and his brothers so that was basically the end of my living at home per se i was 14 so for the next couple of years i worked at another family business uh, it was a, a sawmill and it was it was a, a time of introspection. I was starting to read a lot of new stuff. Like I was finally able to get out of the Christian dogma scene and start looking at other things. So I started just sampling everything. I was reading Zechariah Sitchin, and I got the whole ancient aliens perspective I was reading David Icke and I got all the conspiracy theory stuff and just started sticking my fingers in everything trying to figure stuff out because nothing was making sense and I had this math teacher she was, I think it was grade 9 and yeah because I think it was grade 8 or 9 somewhere in there when September 11th happened and this Taiwanese math teacher of mine took us all in, in the classroom and 
she basically said, okay, we're going to take the whole day off and talk about this event that just happened. And we all started throwing theories out, like, oh, it was the Russians, or it was the Chinese, or whatever, because, you know, we're all watching Bond movies, and we have these great ideas of these plots and whatever. And then she, she, she was a really short Taiwanese lady, like maybe five-something, and she just spoke up and said, who benefits? And that was the start of a whole chain reaction in my brain. I didn't appreciate it at, at that time. But... She, she threw out the idea that very day. What if the Bush regime or somebody in that in that scene had something to do with it? Like, what if, you know, consider these other alternative ideas. Like, try to make sense of it in ways that don't fit your preconceived notions. So at the time, we all laughed. And, okay, this crazy teacher, all right, whatever. But... Over the, over the next few years, I mean, my brain really started to work that way, like not accepting answers at face value. And I guess having been lied to by parents really kind of opens you up to that, questioning authority. If, if, if you start becoming used to being lied to, then you start asking more questions, I guess. So... Really early on, I was conditioned to not accept answers at face value, seek my own answers, do my own reading, due diligence, all that crap. And let's face it, in, in a small town farming community on the plains of Canada, I mean, somebody who's wired like that doesn't necessarily fit in with the rest of the crowd. <laughs> so all of my peers, they were preoccupied with, you know, football and getting wasted on the weekend and all that kind of stuff. I was busy reading George Orwell going, you guys, don't you see it? <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, it, it was kind of frustrating, but uh, I mean, by the end of grade 10, I had just had it. I mean, school... I was I was done with school. I realized I was completely wasting all of my time and there was nothing at the end of it for me. There was no pot of gold at the end of this rainbow. So I dropped out and I wrote my standardized tests at the end and I just earned my grade 12 after that without having to go through grade 11 and and 12. So I am you know, I feel fortunate that I was a- able to save those 2 years. But, I mean, from that point on, there was no going back. There was no going back to the old ways. There was no climbing back into that tank full of lobsters that just wants to drag all of, all of the other lobsters back in, you know? It was, and, and I was just talking about this with someone else yesterday. It's like this small-town atmosphere of people that don't want to let you go. Because when you start making these alternative choices when you decide that you want something else something different you're insulting them they take it personally so in order to get out of that lobster tank you have to be willing to insult everybody else in the tank and you have to be willing to accept their hatred for it because very few people are willing to accept that I think out of my whole class, only two people, me and one other guy, got out. They're all still back there now. They're all still just marrying each other in this little small (laughs) pond, you know, just procreating and doing the same thing they've always been doing. And it's, it's really depressing when you look back on it. But anyway, one thing led to another, and eventually I found myself in California, and... I was living with my girlfriend at the time, managing this art gallery there. And all of a sudden, I, I started seeing this guy on TV. It was 2007 and somewhere in there, and it was R- R- Ron Paul. And he started making a whole lot of sense. He started talking about non-aggression principle, and taxation is theft. And it's like, once that started... T- to all soak in and I started to look him up and read his books and check out his history and libertarian party what is that you know like one domino kind of clashed into the next and it's just it was a pivotal moment for me because I had rejected Christianity and the moral package you know the ethic 
you know, box that comes with that. I'd thrown that out. And I said, you know what? That's all bullshit. And I was left with this void, this nihilistic sort of uh, absence or absence of a moral structure. And then Ron Paul came along and introduced the non-aggression principle and gave me hope that, wait a minute, there might still be a secular moral structure that makes sense without needing superstition or any of this other stuff. So that really got me fired up. And within a few years, I found other people like Walter Block and Stefan Molyneux and these guys who really made a good case for secular ethics and like a consistent moral structure that made perfect sense in, you know, it's all founded upon the the common pursuit for living together peacefully. Now, not all cultures value that. I mean, I read, I read part of the Talmud, for instance, where it says that, you know, property rights and contracts and, and agreements are only valid amongst, you know, fellow Jews, and with Gentiles, they're not valid, and it's it's perfectly good to screw them over and things like that. So it was it was really refreshing to find an ethical package that was consistent and universally applicable. It didn't matter who you are. It didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter your sex, your color, your creed, anything. These same principles were universally applicable to everybody. And as soon as I found that and it pieced it together and it made sense, that was it. That was, that was me. I'm, I'm, I'm now going to conform to this <laughs> from now on. And you would think that would make it easier. And in many ways, it, it did. But holy shit, how many people actually think that way? How many people are willing to hold themselves to those standards? It made life very interesting. Let's just put it that way. I mean, I ended up moving back to Vancouver, and I had like $8 in my back pocket, basically. I was just trusting myself that I would figure something out. I had no plan. But one thing led to another, and I found that I was able to make good friendships for the first time. Before that, I was... I was hooking up with these people that we would have one or two things in common with and we could, you know, we could focus on that common ground and then we'd have fights about other things. But for the first time, I was, I was, I was making friends that we were 100% connected on and where we didn't fight at all. You know, we saw eye to eye consistently and it, it was because I held them to this high standard. So it took a few years, but once you develop a track record of success that you can look back on and say, wow, this is really working, you know, all of a sudden I had all these friends that, that thought this same way, that bought these same principles, that, you know, strived for these virtues, and I was happier. I mean, really, that's what it comes down to, right? We're all just trying to, you know, live happily and productively and peacefully and this got the job done. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> so, after a while, I, you know, I was thinking, you know, how should I be living? What's the, you know, because I was r renting a place in Vancouver where it's very expensive, and yeah, I felt like I was wasting value, you know, spending on rent that just gets vaporized, you know. So I, I started thinking, okay, maybe I should be buying an RV and I should just do like the Nomad deal or whatever, which seemed like a pretty decent idea at th the time. But then I saw an ad on YouTube, I believe it was, for Galt's Gulch Chile. And I think it was Jeff Berwick at the time that was promoting that. And it, that seemed like the perfect answer right there. All these people who also buy in, you know, and live this way. You know, libertarians, anarchists, whatever these 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 people that value the same things and and consider the same things virtuous that I do, all moving to the same place in this foreign country, away from the you know the thieving grasp of the Canadian state or the U.S. state or whatever. And there was there was just this, this dream, you know, you know, where you can have all these cool neighbors that don't want to screw you over, that don't want to rob you. For some special interest, you know, it's just 
all these really cool people that are thoughtful, philosophical, that you can live amongst and share life with. So that was it. As soon as I heard about that, I was sold. And so I bought a Bitcoin miner with some friends. And the timing was just perfect that our miner was able to pay for itself in the first 10 days. And we were able to make all, all this money that I was able to use to move to Chile with. So everything worked out perfectly. And then when I arrived, there was an entrepreneurship boot camp here that I signed up for because really it was like, a prepackaged group of friends waiting, you know. So all these people spoke English and they were into the same things that, that I was into. So I spent three months in this program and made a lot of great friends there. And it's a really good program in the sense that they push you to develop yourself and look inside yourself and, and you know, challenge yourself to develop business ideas that really conform to your true calling. And most people who showed up had no idea what their true calling was. They just knew what their parents told them or what their teachers told them or what society told them or what authority figures or cops or whoever told them. They, they had never asked themselves, what is it that really makes me burn? You know, What, what can I not, not do? Like, If I fast forward in, into the future when I'm 70, 80 years old in my chair thinking back, what do I want to have done? You know, like, I don't want to think back and go, shit, I wasted my life. I wish I had done this. That thing that you wish you had done, just do that now because you are young now. Just fucking do it. So being in this group of 40 or so people all on that same wavelength in this intense, you know, environment was a great way to start this whole process, you know, moving to Chile, bam, instantly you're in this great group of friends. But all the while, I was thinking, okay, as soon as this is done, I'm moving into Galt's Gulch, and I'm going to help this project because it's a great idea. And to be frank, once I got there, I mean, I didn't give up on the dream, but it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. It was pretty much a ghost town once I got there. Um, I, I would find out later on that uh, Berwick had been pushed out of the project, for instance, and Basically, all of this political infighting had happened, and there was a lot of just really bad management, I, I guess you could say. And the project was doomed, essentially. So I was there for its last, like, three months of gasping breath. <laughs> and I basically got to watch its, its final days as it was dying. And it was a really interesting time because I got to learn from all of that. I got to watch what was going on, what was working, what wasn't. And while I was there, it was like, everything was so quiet. It was just, you know, Ken Johnson was the manager on site at that time. And he, you know, he, he was, I think he saw himself almost like, you know, the Atlas hero figure trying to carry everything on his own shoulders, you know. That was, that was like the image that he was trying to p portray. And... Maybe part of them thought that way, but it was a huge project. I mean, it was a sprawling valley. Like, it was massive. No one person could have ever managed something that big by himself. It was absurd. So that was one of the biggest lessons that I took from all of that, was that, that no matter how smart you think you are, you can never do something that big by yourself. You need collaborators, you need teammates, you need people on board who can fill those gaps that you have. I'm not good at everything. I'm decent at a few things, and I can focus on doing those things well, but holy crap, like Luke Crowley, for instance, he's one of my my partners. He's like, he's a very grounded type of practical type person, whereas I'm like the flighty, idealistic, you know... I have like this vision of how things should be, whereas he he always like drags me down saying, "No, no, th this is how it is. You know? <laughs> Deal with reality. Worst case scenario." So it's like having this dynamic team of people to fill in all of those little gaps is is priceless. You you can't not have that if you're going to succeed at something this big. 
So, I mean, this last year of building Fort Galt up as a project has just been a, not just a learning process, but a process of, of growth and affirmation because I had kind of come along with this this hunch, this theory that I thought I knew that I was on the right track. And I've kind of just been proving myself right as as I've went because I know what I'm good at and I know what I suck at. And as long as you're honest, then you can make up for those areas that you lack in. But if you're not honest, you're going to run into all kinds of problems. So I think we've been able to learn from a lot of the bad examples all around us during this short period of time. And so far, I think we're doing a pretty damn good job of trying to make things right. Because this this dream of Galt's Gulch was so big and so awesome. Like, I was so sold on it from day one. And it was such a disappointment when it fell apart that I think we need a win, you know? This, this, this was such a tragic loss that, you know, the mainstream media pounced all over it. Oh, libertarians can't do a- anything right. See, here's what happens when libertarians try to do something. It all goes to shit. So we need a win in the worst way. And I think the formula that we've got going right now, the structure we've got going, is the best way to guarantee that we actually get a win. It's not going to be huge. It, it, it's not going to be like landing a rocket on Mars, but it's going to be a win that we can build off of. So right now we've got about 31 people on board, and we're only about a quarter of the way in towards our goal. But I'm already blown away by the quality of people that have stepped forward because we're attracting like minds. Like uh, attracts like. And when you have high standards, as I've been trained to have all these years, that's, that's the main lesson that I take from life, is the, the necessity of standards and non-compromise. It's so tempting to compromise your standards to attract more money, you know? If, if you're trying to do something that's expensive, like we're trying to do, obviously, it's so tempting to say, you know what? Everybody with money, just come on in. Yeah. <laughs> but... At the end of the day, the health of the project depends on the health and the quality of the people. Because it is just people. We're all just people. Markets are our people. So we've got 31 fucking amazing people, let me just say, so far. <laughs> Makers, doers, people of quality with value to bring to the table. That I know it's, it's done. Like As far as I'm concerned, we've already won. We just have to show everybody else what that looks like now wow and awesome story <laughs> and, you, and you say you say you're just a quarter of the way in right <laughs> yes <Wow>. and rant <laughs> yeah <laughs> no probably it's okay it was great um yeah i mean uh just just uh referring back to your childhood you know um i think um that's one of the difficulties that a lot of um volunteers have is in pursuing um you know alternative perspectives that are contrary to the beliefs of our parents, you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles, because as yeah. children, you always seek the approval of those around you, right? Especially the family members, because those are the ones that raised you, right? So, so need it. It's, it's a survival mechanism. You can't not have the approval of your parents. Yeah. Like, I, I remember I was four years old, I think, and we were at a park once. And I was playing, I was having a great time, and my dad wanted to leave. I said, no, I'm having fun, or, or, or something to that extent. And he's like, okay, well, I'm going to leave, and you can stay here. And like to him, that's, that, that was funny, right? But to a child, that's, that's a death threat. <laughs> that's, that's like, you know, ch- children that young cannot survive without their parents, so the threat of being abandoned is the threat of death. You cannot not have the approval of your parents like it's it's key to your survival so you can form and i still have a few friends who are christian and have kids and it's you know a little bit of an awkward discussion at at the table you know <laughs> when the kids ask me about this stuff and this actually happened once last year the this this kid asked me, oh, why aren't you Christian and stuff like that? And I just very quickly, I I just kind of made the choice. You know what? 
kids cannot be at odds with their parents when they're when they're that young. You know, you you have to just kind of toe the line and keep the peace and yes, mom, yes, dad, and just kind of go with the flow. When you're old enough, I'll find you and I'll set you straight. But <laughs> until then, you know, just toe the line and keep your head down. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as a parent, I, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and and that's one of the difficult things that I explain to other people with kids or who are planning to have kids is um, is I don't want to you know I don't have, I don't want my child to view me as a superior or as an authority figure or you know somebody that lays down the law and you just have to obey no because then then it's like it's kind of mindless like you're not teaching the child to reason or to philosophically understand anything you're just saying obey me <laughs> and and then the worst is mm-hmm. when, you, when you tell your children you know uh, listen to me. I'll explain when you're older, <laughs> and that's the worst. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it's like that's essentially saying you are stupid right now, and I'm not going to explain this to you. And, and the thing with you reasoning, don't shit. Kids, <laughs> say yeah. yeah, it's like you are an authority figure, but you should be a voluntary one. You know, like. I'm not going to pretend to know how to operate on my own heart, you know. I'm going to consult the surgeon who knows what he's doing and and has earned authority, you know. Mm. He's an authority on that that subject. But he has to earn that authority and it has to be given voluntarily. He can't come at me with a scalpel saying, I'm going to operate on your heart, you know. It's, whoa. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, uh... And that's one. That's one of the things that's difficult for other parents to realize when when they kind of or, or when I explain my parenting method. You know, I, I tell them that I want to be like a friend, like a peer. I want my child to view me. If if anything, if if it's not equal, then I want him to view me as an advisor that he would come to me voluntarily for advice if he has a question, mm-hmm. right? Because. Because, you know, again, like you said, it's not an achievement to be a father, all right? It's a very simple thing to be a father or a mother. That's, that in itself yes. is not an achievement and does not earn respect in the least, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That is earned through many, many years of demonstrating to your children <clears throat> that your advice is valuable. And then if they mm-hmm. don't follow it, they're going to get hurt, right? That's that's basically, you know, how you earn respect is you, you show people your experience. And so, yeah. Yeah, my whole perspective on that that whole deal really got flipped on its head when somebody suggested that parents are service providers. Parenting is a service, Mm -hmm. and children are clients, Mm -hmm. and they're clients in an arrangement that they can't get out of. It's like they're locked in this huge 18-year contract, right? Like like hostages, I I explain to people. Exactly. It's like... (laughs) It's like if you invited someone over to your house and then they got injured and couldn't leave. Yeah. Well, as long as they're in your house, you're kind of responsible for their well-being, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like they have no way out. It's like with marriage, for instance, your wife, if you start being a complete dick, like she has the option to leave. Mm-hmm. Your kid doesn't have that option. Mm-hmm. So you have to you have to provide the utmost, you know, service quality because they're they have no way out, you know they're at your mercy, they're helpless, you know, and then there's also kind of a long term strategy to this that a lot of people don't appreciate until they're really old, which is you're investing I mean, I guess maybe that's a, a benefit of growing up in a small town farming situation is we were so interconnected um if somebody bought a piece of machinery or something everybody in the whole area knew that that guy has that thing you know oh he just bought a new i don't know post pounder you know for fences Mm -hmm. so if i ever need one i i call him up and i borrow it from him Mm -hmm. and it was understood that well of course if you called him up and asked to borrow his his thing he would say yes but if he called you up you would say yes if he wanted to borrow something of uh, of yours, there was just this unspoken interconnectedness. If you needed help building a road or a, a barn or you know something like that, you could call your neighbors and they would help you, and you would help them back. And so, I think this this carries over because when you're having kids, you're kind of hoping that they're going to be for you later 
they're they're that they're going to be there for you later in life, right? Because eventually the rules are going to flip around, and you're going to be an old crazy man wearing this giant diaper, and <laughs> your your kid is going to be going, okay, well, you know, you're wandering. You're wandering into traffic. Maybe I should spank you, you know? <laughs> it's like the roles completely flip around. Oh, yeah. And hopefully, hopefully you will have earned a feeling of gratitude and indebtedness and r- reciprocation. You know, if, if you have provided them quality service, then they'll feel like they should provide you with quality service. That's just how that works. Whereas these parents, like mine, for instance, I'm afraid if if my dad, you know, came down with some illness and was and got turned into some kind of feeble vegetable, I wouldn't go. I I, I wouldn't be there for him. I mean, he, you know, he did not earn that reciprocal value, which is unfortunate because it, it's it's very common. I mean, I don't know very many people that have that kind of a solid bond. Which sucks because we all should. Mm. I mean, this this is my dream with Fort Galt is d- developing this community where everybody has this kind of a bond, where you can knock on anybody's door and know that they're there for you. I mean, they're not obligated. There's there's no law saying they have to be, but they want to be because they know that you're there for them. Mm. I guess it all just comes down to the ideals, you know. I have this this idea of how things should be, and instead of trying to force people to live that way, I, I, I just say, like, how can I offer myself in such a way that other people want to reciprocate and create this kind of a situation that I thought should have been normal, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like... When I moved to Vancouver for the first time, it was the first big city that I had ever lived in. And it was very weird to me because everybody's, you know, they live so close to each other. They're boxed into these little compartments. And when you're forced to be close to each other, you spend all, all your time putting up blinds, you know, trying to like put up walls and, and close your windows so that your neighbors don't see you. And, you know, I want my privacy, damn it. You know, it's like, whereas, where I grew up, we were all spread apart, so we made the effort to reach out to each other. Mm. So I, I guess I'm trying to bring the best of both worlds t- together, where we're easily accessible to each other, and we still have that that community-mindedness where we want to reach out t- to one another without feeling that we're trampling on each other's privacy. It's like voluntary association versus forced when it's forced, it sucks balls. There is nothing worse than being forced to be with people that you don't want to be with. But being with people voluntarily that you think are awesome, there's nothing better. And being in the libertarian movement, for lack of a better term, the objectivists, the you know the Ayn Rand fans or whatever, there's a lot of that. There's people who are born into situations that were not voluntary and they've spent their whole lives trying to get out of it. I'm an individualist. I'm a I'm a I'm a rugged individual, goddammit. I don't need these collectivists, you know, socialists, communist fuckers. Which is understandable cuz you're you're trying to get out of what you were forced into. But with Fort Galt, the philosophy is okay, now what? Okay, you got out of that. You're no longer in the forced, you know, c- collectivist environment. You're out. You're on your own. Now what? You still have the rest of your life. Do you want to be lonely? Do you want to be on your island with, with your shotgun by yourself? <laughs> exactly. That's fun for maybe a month, tops. But then you get bored and you get lonely and you want to do awesome stuff with awesome people. That's what we're doing. Nice, nice. Um, you, you know, you, you mentioned uh, you know the difference between forced um, interaction and and voluntary interaction. And to us, it's such a simple and logical. And um, you know, how could anybody 
be against voluntary interaction you know like, it, it, it's like, how can that like like explode people's minds you know like it it, rem it, it kind of um reminds me of the uh the recent um thing in indiana i think it was where the they they ruled um was it in indiana where it was when the guy uh Bake the didn't want to bake a cake for the 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 KKK member something like that right, right. 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 um and, and that caused a huge there there's a few stories going on simultaneously I think one was that there was a bakery that didn't want to provide a cake for a gay marriage yeah right right that's it yeah that was that was, that was the thing and it was it was funny because as soon as this became like this big controversial story all these other like christian people started sending in like crowdfunding money to this bakery you know <laughs> like solidarity or something but it's like in a free market you are free to discriminate against whoever the shit you want you can put up a sign saying no jews and no blacks you know like you can do that you can be as dumb as you want there's you know there's and the market is free to respond ac accordingly. So, hey, if you're in some redneck town or whatever that is cool with that, then I guess it's not going to hurt. But in the greater scheme of things, a whole lot of people are going to boycott your, your, your place. They're, they're not going to be cool with it. They're not going to come to your establishment, and that's, that's fine. What naturally happens as a result is society kind of splits and tribes form. Nations form not based on geography or religion, but based on just principles. So pe people of like principles are going to find each other, especially now where we have internet and email. And this, this level of technology we have now is allowing people of like principle to find each other and gather. I mean, something like what we're doing now with Fort Galt wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. There's just no way that we would have found each other. Even 10 years ago, it would have been hard. We've just reached this point now where we have the tools. We have the ability to find each other worldwide and gather. And over the next few decades, we're going to just see more and more of this. We're going to see new uh, provinces, new cities, new countries being formed on like ideals. And I'm looking forward to it because honestly, like, I've had so many arguments now with like zeitgeist people and Venus Project types and 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 whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where it's like they have these great ideas, but they want to force it on people. Well, some of them want to force it on people. Some of them don't. Some of them are are, are more voluntarist. There's so many divides within that community even. But it's like, just do it. Get together. Get your little piece of land. You you know, just put into practice these ideas that you preach and may the best ones win you know in a free market of ideas where competing principles you know compete for people that that that's what it's going to be there's going to be these towns sprouting up saying we stand for this you know we have no taxes we have you know we we stand by this principle we support these people whatever and people will see that and go, wow, that sounds really cool. I want to go live there. Mm -hmm. And they're going to vote with their feet. Mm -hmm. And great ideas will attract great people. And the best ideas win. That's what I want to see. Yeah, the Zeitgeisters, they, they are uh, interesting. That's kind of what got me into this, um, is Zeitgeist. I, I, you too? Totally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I found those documentaries. And I mean, I mean, I think they're great documentaries, in terms of describing the monetary system, the Federal Reserve, you know, yes. uh, Mandrix mechanism. One, the first one was complete gold. Like yeah. I, I can't, I can't fault that one very much at all. The second one, I mean, I was along for the ride. I was buying into it, and then I thought, wait, 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 wait what? <laughs> Hang on a sec. Yeah. And then the third one was, oh my god. <laughs> but that's okay. It was all just part of the process, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Um, I uh, that was before I found volunteerism and uh, and so it yeah. seemed like a good idea to me. Um, I wasn't familiar with other options. Then when I found volunteerism, I'm like you know what, this makes a lot more sense than the other one. Oh, like, really? Robots can robots are gonna be <laughs> gonna be deciding what everybody needs, like the food, like rice and beans and meat and everything, vegetables. <laughs> They're gonna be deciding everything, and people are not gonna. What about my? <laughs> what about the things I want that make no sense to you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
Um, what about yeah. my hockey cards? <laughs> yeah, and the way they said, I think like nobody's gonna have to work because technology is gonna take care of everything. And it's just, it just seems like a really, mm-hmm. I guess that's the definition of utopian. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, your robots. Oh, sure. Are- and I mean, go ahead, yeah. A lot of them, a lot of them have great intentions. They have great hearts. They have great big, like you know, feels, right? <laughs> but unfortunately a lot of them lack the more cerebral you know theory oriented logic stuff that more of the right anarchists or the libertarians tend to have more of and to be fair a lot of the libertarians tend to lack a lot of the feels that the left has right (laughs) they both tend to be a little bit deficient in a certain area and if they would come together and you know be able to work cooperatively in that sense they could complete each other perhaps quite a bit more than they do but i don't know it's just as soon as you put the guns down everything seems to work so much better you know this i know earlier on peter joseph was a lot more vocal about you know we need to make those who don't agree agree by making them learn better you know like this this language was much more overt, you know, five years ago, for instance. Whereas now, I think a lot of them are starting to see that, you know what, that, that kind of forceful language doesn't get us anywhere. We have to let this be a voluntary, organic process. And there are still some of them that are more hardcore, but I've, I've been able to, to get along with more of them now because they're willing to take the more free market approach to things. And I think they're starting to also see that the free market is providing a lot of the solutions that they were talking about. Um, seasteading, 3D printing, Bitcoin. These are brilliant solutions to all these problems that they were talking about back when the first Zeitgeist came out. And these solutions have been presented by the free market. They've been, they've been provided by people incentivized to provide solutions it's not being provided by communists. It's not being provided by egalitarian, utopian, whatever, robot commies. You know, it's it's the free market providing solutions to problems on a practical basis. I think a lot of them get that. And great. I mean, in the future, I, I hope to see, you know, a zeitgeist donut Venus project town, you know, and then an ANCAP Galt's Gulch kind of a Randian town over here, and all kinds of different experimental communities competing and trading with each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, that would be an awesome site, definitely. Absolutely. But can you can you go into um, a little bit more seasteading because I heard of that recently, and um, it, it sounds like a pretty cool idea. Can you share what you think? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, we're just putting the finishing touches on. A, a new ad for the Seasteading Institute. We've been playing with that for the last month or so here. It's It's been kind of interesting. But the basic premise is that every square inch of land on the earth has been claimed by a state. Almost every square inch. There might be the odd little no man's land here or there that sucks balls. But for the most part, every useful piece of land on the planet has been claimed. And in order to function on this land, you have to bend to the will of the state. So you have to be willing to be ruled over by somebody, some gang with guns. And so the Seasteading Institute is sort of a product of the free market saying, okay, we have a demand for freedom and for competition of ideas, but there's no supply. I left. So how can we address that problem? And they said, well, okay, 70 to 80 percent of the Earth's surface is water. It's the ocean. And then that's not claimed. It's wide open. It's outside of the jurisdiction of all of these states. So how, how can we make use of that square footage? So seasteading is all about creating floating platforms upon which you can build to create new states or just new land without a state even. So a lot of people have the idea of having sort of uh, a free association model where you can build your own platform or you can buy a platform and have your house on it and 
you can connect to your platform with other platforms. So people who are like-minded and share the same values, they can cluster in, in groups and, and create new floating islands that run a certain way. So I think, in principle, it has a lot of potential. I mean, it hasn't been done yet, really. I mean, there's been artificial islands built. There's a couple in the United Arab Emirates. China's trying to make one right now. And, of course, there's clusters of houseboats. There's cruise ships, which are basically giant floating skyscrapers. So it's not an, a completely outlandish idea, but it's ambitious. I mean... The, we'll we'll show you soon the models that we've been creating in 3D CAD and and whatnot. But it's an ambitious and expensive project at first. But they're hoping to prove the concept in the next five to ten years and have their fo the first floating city finished to show people like this is what it looks like. Go nuts! <laughs> so I don't know. I think as long as the land is being dominated by the state, there's going to be a market to fill on the high seas for people that want to get out of that. And kind of a secondary objective of seasteading is that once you offer competition, once you present competition, then the other existing landmass states, they have to answer that because... The seasteads, if they're superior, will drain people from their pre-existing countries. So in Canada, if you're on a surgery wait list of 13, 14 months, which is very normal for heart surgery, all of a sudden you'll see a, a seastead where you can go and have your heart surgery right now at the same price. Or like, So obviously you're going to move. Or if you're in a country that bans certain scientific research, like you know s stem cell research or something like that, then you're going to move away from your land and go to a seastead where you can operate freely. If you want to deal in currency trading or banking and the country that you're in has laws that prevent you from doing what you want to do, you can leave and go to a seastead. So with more competition, the current governments that we have are going to either have to evolve and change and adapt and become more reasonable or they'll fail. At least that's the theory. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like an awesome idea. I definitely would uh, love to see that, you know, um, take shape. You know, I'd be very interested to yeah. to take part in that. It's, uh, that's a very attractive definitely. idea. Um, and also, I, I saw there's like, is it called air steading? Like cities <laughs> in the air. Have you seen that too? Yeah, I saw a few 3D renderings recently where they're, I think there's a couple of companies now that are trying to bring airships back. Oh my god. Which, I mean, dollar for dollar, they make no sense whatsoever in, in terms of just getting from point A to point B. But if it's a novelty, if it's like the Orient Express of the skies or something <laughs> luxurious, you know, like a cruise ship kind of thing, then, you know, there might be a niche market for that. So it would be cool to see, I think. But I think it seems it would be much more expensive than, than seasteading because you need, you need yes. constant fuel just to stay. Or, or I guess if, if they figure out, you know, how to make solar energy, like, you know, possible. And, but, you know, it seems pretty like uh, seasteading. You know, you don't necessarily need constant fuel if you're just floating, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sky steading makes makes sense on Venus, for instance, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because on Venus uh, the the surface is completely unfeasible. A human would die instantly on the the surface, mm -hmm. and if you're too high above the clouds, then you're cl too close to the sun, so you would burn up. But if you're in the clouds at a certain level mm -hmm. on a a skystead, then you could theoretically live, but <laughs> that's that's not going to happen tomorrow. Let's <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it'd definitely be an ambitious project, indeed. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I don't want to take yeah. up any more of your time. Um, I know you're a busy guy. So, why don't you let people know where they can find your work? Uh, Facebook, YouTube, or website? 
Yeah, the the Fort Galt project is just fortgalt.com. Um, if if you want to hook up with me on Facebook, I'm just facebook.com slash sheer, S-C-H-E-A-R-E. Or I've got some articles on shrugout.liberty.me also. Any uh, any website? Fortgalt.com. Fortgalt.com. Nice. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, for the awesome conversation. Um, learned a lot. I, uh, I, this is actually the first time I've heard of uh, Fort Galt, so um, I'll be looking forward to see how it pans out. You know, it seems like you got excellent people down there managing it. So I don't think I don't think it's planned for the uh, the devastating consequences <laughs> that uh, the other one, <laughs> Galt's Gulch, had. I think you guys can learn from their mistakes, right? We have the advantage of being. Part two. Part two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the first version is always hardest because you know you're you, you're doing something for the first time and you're you're vulnerable to all of the problems that come with startups. But the second guy t- to bat has the advantage of seeing what the first guy did wrong. So yeah. I think we have the the edge that way. <laughs> exactly. Well, excellent. Sounds sounds great. Thank you for the conversation, uh, Gabriel. So this is. Uh, cool. Peaceful Anarchism on uh, the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. and the Conscious Resistance uh, dot com and the Seeds of Liberty dot com. Uh, wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye.